Well, it is 10 o'clock and we're going to go ahead and get started because I know this overview is going to be a lot of information and Dan will probably have a lot of questions. So, so welcome to this week's Purdue at Westgate webinar series. My name is Samantha Nelson and I am the program manager for the Purdue Foundry Westgate located in the Westgate Academy. We at Purdue at Westgate strive to promote business and talent growth, and we want to help support you, the startup, the small business, as a defense contractor, and as a government employee. One way of supporting you is to provide you with valuable resources. We think that one of these valuable resources is today's webinar on the overview of hypersonics research. Hypersonics seems to be a big buzz topic. It is also an extremely broad topic that one webinar will not be able to do it justice. Our intent is to provide you within the next couple months a series of hypersonic webinars that will discuss research, ecosystem, and defense. Today, we are excited to be hosting a webinar with our fellow partner at Purdue University, Dr. Dan De Laurentiis. I have had the pleasure of meeting and working with Dan on a couple different occasions. And if you aren't familiar with him already, I think you are going to be impressed by his knowledge and level of experience in the hypersonics field, as well as many others. One of his titles, as he wears many hats, is Director of the Institute of Global Security and Defense Innovation, also known as IGSDI, at Purdue University. But he is also a professor in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Director of the Center for Integrated Systems in Aerospace. There are so many accolades that are tied to Dr. De Laurentiis, so I would encourage you to look them up to find out more, as there are way too many to go over during this time frame. We ask that you mute your microphones, and if comfortable, you can turn your videos on during the presentation. Either way is going to be good for us. I will be moderating questions during the presentation, so please feel free to ask any questions by using the chat function on your screen. The presentation will be recorded and will be sent to you afterwards via email, as well as the copy of the slide presentation. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Dan De Laurentiis. Thank you, Samantha. I'll go ahead and share my screen and go into full screen mode. So how are we doing for a sound check and a, a screen check? Good? Good. All right. Well, thank you. That's uh, That was quite a glowing uh, introduction. Uh, 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 certainly a lot to live up to and, and indeed a very broad topic. Um, and I, I already see some of my uh, Purdue colleagues on, on the line here who are more expert uh, than I am in many areas of hypersonics. But I think because of some of my job titles uh, that Samantha mentioned, as well as my own personal research at the systems level, I, I think uh, uh, giving this overview of hypersonics research and, and perhaps as importantly for this particular webinar, seminar, you know, sort of ways that I've seen we can partner uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to, to give this, this talk and have this discussion with you, which I hope it's all of that and more. So, so again, thanks to um, all the, the sponsors of this webinar series. And uh, you, you'll actually see a, a mention of, of how IN3, one of the sponsors actually plays a critical role in this as well. So, um, let's see. yes. Uh, there's my title, so I'll move on with the, the big P there. Uh, so again, I, I know I have a, a broad spectrum of people uh, on, on the line here who, uh, again, maybe have deep, uh, if not deeper exposure to hypersonics than me, and, and some who perhaps have, uh, have very little. And so I, I did structure this presentation, and given that it, was, it is an overview, uh, I, I wanted to start from the very highest level um, to say that you know, there's, there's a quite a significant diversity when we talk about hypersonic flight, hypersonic systems. Uh, clearly, many of those applications, some of which you can see here, are, are in the military and defense uh, domain. But access to space, uh, uh, reentry systems, especially planetary reentry systems, um, are other examples of hypersonic uh, conditions that we see with flight vehicles. And, and therefore, there's actually a substantial body of work that's taken place over, uh, over many years 
uh, that can be leveraged uh, across application areas. So some of the things we've learned when we started putting things into space uh, in terms of how to bring uh, uh, vehicles and systems back from space in the planetary reentry realm, which has high plasma effects and other uh, very typical challenges related to hypersonic flows and control of systems in hypersonic regimes, you know, can play a role in, in, in some of our uh, other domain applications. So this is a very uh, diverse uh, area. And, and of course, the other thing is when you, when you consider that all of these vehicles, whether they're in the military defense domain or the civil uh, domain, et cetera, you know, we're not just uh, interested in, in putting up uh, chunks of metal and bringing it back without burning up or making it fly somewhere. So issues related to intelligence, autonomy, control, uh, capabilities to maneuver cross range, uh, all those things, uh, you know, really make this a truly exciting field. So that's another thing I wanted to emphasize in my introduction to this talk is that hypersonic flight is, is more than just about, uh, you know, the aerodynamics or the propulsion aspects of a flight vehicle, although those obviously remain center, central to the key challenges in hypersonics. All right, more specifically, uh, and, and for those wanting a little bit uh, more of a touch of the, of the technical details, this is probably my most technical uh, slide here. And I, I give credit to uh, Professor John Paji, one of our collaborators here at Purdue, who I think was the originator of this slide. But as my comments just a moment ago uh, referenced, um, when you think about you know, the, the emerging vehicles we have in, in, in the military uh, domain for hypersonic flight. Again, like any aircraft design problem, which, you know, really my core uh, fundamental research capabilities start dating back to graduate school is in the design modeling analysis and optimization of complex aerospace vehicles, of which this particular class is, is a great example. You have uh, very compact systems with very severe constraints on size, weight, and power um, that have to have unbelievable performance in very stressing physical domains across several different physical domains. And so altogether, uh, uh, Mother Nature and, and realms of physics uh, are almost exhaustively covered in these particular applications. You can see on the right-hand side, you know, issues related to um, what we call aerothermodynamics, the fact that with the intense heating we see in hypersonic flight, uh, that really changes fundamentally the aerodynamic performance uh, of the vehicle and, and actually the vehicle shape uh, may change in, in uh, not insignificant ways, which complicate uh, the prediction of aerodynamic performance and, and most especially the prediction of control surface uh, effectiveness and those kinds of things. So you can see across that vehicle, uh, the issues of shock boundary layer interaction. I mentioned the fluid structure inter interaction. And then you know, for those vehicles, those hypersonic vehicles that are uh, propelled have their own propulsion versus just uh, boosted gliding systems, you have tremendous challenges in how we do scramjet propulsion. You know, the, the, the way we measure our current flight test, a scramjet flight test uh, experience is, is literally in seconds. That's the unit of measure of, of how much time we have, you know, probably now maybe a handful of minutes. And so this is a tremendous challenge, especially as we think about uh, propulsion, you know, onboard propulsion for these systems. And, and across this very, you know, fairly complex geometry, you, you can see issues of heating and transition and turbulence that can be very different in one spot. Um, from a very, even very close adjacent uh, spot somewhere else on the vehicle. So multidisciplinary physics, disparate scales. Again, um, this gets into some of the core research as I expose you to the tremendous excellence and scale of Purdue faculty uh, covering these many areas. They're really leaders in modeling uh, these forms of physics and, and tackling the design challenges that they generate. On the left-hand side is sort of a different view of some of this more multidisciplinary aspects, especially things related to the fact that um, in almost every case, uh, there is a desire and a need to have onboard sensing for these vehicles, um, you know, for the missions that vehicles are, are expected. 
to uh, to execute again, both in the military and the civil domains, having the ability to sense its environment where it is from a you know a physics perspective in terms of the flow characteristics it appears to be flying in, and how to use the sensed information also for navigation, uh, guidance and control. These are all very strong challenges uh, in, in in the you know especially driven by the fact that these vehicles are typically wrapped in, in a plasma environment, which makes it very difficult to do these things with our, our conventional sensors and control uh, systems. So uh, suffice it to say, I probably spent more time than on this slide than I expected. That shows my bias, of course, as a, as a professor and a, a researcher in this area, but nonetheless, it's very important groundwork for uh, the remainder of my talk, which is really more about the broader picture and the challenges we could all partner on. Um, as I sort of transition into that, uh, of course, I, I want to highlight that, you know, I, I think in the DOD community, uh, hypersonic offense is, it gets a lot of attention because there are some major programs that are becoming quite well known. Uh, and and in, in some sense, you know, our, our uh, defense leaders have said this openly and publicly, we have some catch up to do in terms of uh, de developing and especially testing and proving out uh, offensive hypersonic systems of a variety of kinds. So uh, again, uh, the point of this slide is to say that the need to field systems means that we can't just have this wonderfully challenging and interesting physics uh, tackled in isolated ways. And so uh, the challenge is multidisciplinary and at Purdue, we emphasize wherever possible and pursue wherever possible research opportunities and partnerships that give us the opportunity to do multidisciplinary research centered around system design. So we always have at the forefront uh, of our research questions, uh, at least an understanding, if not a direct objective function from the vehicle or mission level driving the investigation that we're doing, okay? So that's the main point here, very important. And, you know, depending on where your particular organization or firm is coming from, you, you might, you know, see yourself as, as only uh, an entity innovating in thermophysics or something like that. But it's important to know that even if you partner, um, you should be aware of these broader uh, drivers. The other thing on the upper right, it's, it's really become part and parcel of how we can even have a hope of tackling these challenges. And that is the unique and scientifically rigorous way that we combine computation, experiments, and theory in our sort of physic core physics-based domain across those different areas I mentioned on the last slide, combined with uh, the integration design and analysis. And so as with everything else, the more we can do model-based and, and digital, digitally connected through the thread uh, on the research, the closer we can get to um, to success for fielding these systems. Again, you know, there's there's contracts in place now with the DOD with several firms, several of which we're partnering with uh, to really start producing some of these systems at scale. And Sandia National Labs is, is playing a critical role in that as well, another partner of Purdue, uh, given their, their historic background and current activity in, in developing the core technologies and the knowledge of how you package these into a, a vehicle that can be successful in flight. Let us not forget, uh, as, as much as you saw that I emphasized the last slides and saying first and foremost, it gets a lot of attention. Um, just as important, and in certain circles, especially if you sit at the Missile Defense Agency, uh, defense against hypersonics is critical and, and challenging. The trajectories that hypersonic vehicles, uh, especially the boost glide variety and, and, and the uh, air breathing can, can bring in terms of their maneuverability and, and non-traditional non-ballistic trajectories makes them extremely hard to detect. So there's sensing challenges, where and how can we deploy new sensors, tracking um, how we're gonna you know, look, track and touch these systems from a defensive perspective, how we, we analyze threats, uh, how we do command and control. Uh, you know, there's very few uh, command and control and fire control units and officers who, you know, have experience uh, defending against these systems. So there's a lot of research to be done there. Again, let alone the fact of how are we going to intercept uh, the, these systems uh, in flight. Very significant challenges. 
So, you know, when you see all of these research areas, many, if not all of them have dual use, right? We can understand how to create more uh, effective systems for, for blue, and, and we can also understand how to defend better and predict the performance of red. All right, I'm gonna navigate now to a little bit of the, the, the overview part of this presentation that relates to Purdue in particular, uh, but you'll, you'll see I mentioned some others. And again, this is to try to get the juices flowing for, for ways and touch points for partnership. Um, so again, I apologize. Some of you may, may know this very well, including actually some Purdue people who, who might be on the line who actually run some of these things I'm gonna show you, including starting here. Um, First of all, as you'll see shortly uh, in, with names, Purdue has a, has a strong and cross-disciplinary team across 40 plus faculty. I, I think, uh, you know, really perhaps even tops in the nation in terms of the number of, of Purdue people who, uh, faculty members and of course students that work with them covering different areas of hypersonics. Uh, again, I mentioned we also, uh, not uniformly, but to the extent we can, we faculty conduct our research with a common vision and centered around design because we know this is not sort of something our nation needs in 30 years, um, but really now. So we need to focus around design and manufacturability. Um, we, you know, clearly one of our, our jewels, um, I use that term for a particular reason, uh, is, is our quiet Mach 6 wind tunnel. Uh, the nation's first operational hypersonic quiet tunnel and, and, and still really the premier one in terms of its ongoing continuous effectiveness at, at uh, working uh, in, in this area. Professor Joe Jewell actually is a new faculty member at Purdue who's the primary uh, researcher Hello? in this facility. Hi, may I speak with Barbara, please? Speaking. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Barbara, we have a, uh, I need you on mute. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so uh, we are also developing uh, a quiet, uh, Mach 8 wind tunnel. We haven't talked about it, and I that's uh, that's ongoing, uh, led by Professor Steve Schneider, who, who was also the originator and builder of the Mach 6 tunnel. Um, what are my options? How do I just? Uh, I'm sorry, Samantha. Maybe you can find. Uh, yeah, I was I was trying to uh, trying to find her here to yeah. mute her. I apologize about that. That's okay, I'll just keep talking louder. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention a few things uh, yeah. going forward here about some additional uh, facilities in the wind tunnel category that we have ongoing. But, but again, this is uh, the Mach 6 tunnel is something Purdue is universally known for and our expansion into these other tunnels, which are critical. I won't go into details in this particular overview presentation about what quiet means other than to say uh, these, these uh, uh, experimental uh, apparatus have to really, uh, in this particular case, the, the walls of this wind tunnel are polished to such a high degree and the design of the tunnel is so exquisitely done so that the flow uh, over the, the test article can actually uh, exhibit characteristics, especially in boundary layer behavior that's similar to how you would see a vehicle in flight. You can see from this picture, it's not a very large test section. And one of the challenges, main challenges in any wind tunnel is the fact that, you know, when we fly air vehicles in, in, in the air with mother nature, uh, there's no walls. Uh, but in wind tunnels, we have to have walls in our test section. And in particular, at hypersonic flight, um, you know, the noise, uh, flow noise, if you, you could call it that, that's generated from these walls can really you know, render the physics at the test article to, to sort of be not very characteristic of flight. So that's all I'll say about quietness. It's very hard to do. This is not a construction project to, to build a Mach 8 quiet tunnel. It is a research project and, no, and so no better place than Purdue to be doing this. Last thing I'll mention here on this slide is that Purdue uh, currently supports and I think is, is well known for its ability to do export controlled research. And, and classified research test and evaluation at the appropriate levels uh, and appropriate circumstances. Okay, I promised a, a moment ago that I would show you some names. Uh, this, uh, this and the next slide is actually a copy of a brochure that we produced for our uh, co-hosting our NDIA Purdue Hypersonics Capability Conference last summer. Perhaps some of you were there. 
And so I, I thought this was the most compact way for me <laughs> to make sure my colleagues uh, got some time in the sun, um, but, but also there, there'd be no way that I could even read all the names, let alone talk about their research. So you can see across the top though of this in the next slide are the critical research areas related to hypersonics. And you see a capsule describing that and, um, uh, and the names of the Purdue faculty uh, who are performing uh, research in, in those areas. Actually, uh, you know, again, several of them uh, may be on this particular webinar and also pro probably could be uh, candidates for upcoming webinars on deep dive topics, particular uh, event of interest to some of you that could work with Samantha to schedule those. And hey, across Dan? the bottom are some key milestones. Yes. Dan, we have a question. Yes. Um, from Steve Kress, he says, is Purdue pursuing a sting to measure forces and moments part of the plan to upgrade the current and new quiet tunnel capabilities? I'll take that one if you want, Dan. Oh, good, Joe, you're on. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, it is. That is a plan. And this is this is a difficult. I'll, I'll give you the, the short answer, not to disrupt uh, Dan's talk too much, but we are pursuing that. And in fact, we're pursuing, I have a recent uh, graduate of the Air Force Academy uh, who came to us via the PMRI, Purdue Military Research Institute program, uh, who is working on developing a sting for force and moment capability in the Mach 6 quiet tunnel. And then our intention is to scale that up for the Mach 8 quiet tunnel and uh, perhaps even adapt it to high pulse. The, the basic challenge is that these are living tubes um, high pulse, of course, reflected shock tunnel, expansion tunnel, they have very short test times. And so the shorter the test time you have, the more difficult it is to get accurate force and moment measurements. But there has been some progress made in this area and we're attempting to capitalize on it to develop those. So very specific, but uh, good question. Indeed, glad you're on, Joe. And you already got a call out from me. Excellent, oops, okay. Um, Second page of, of this brochure, um, again, speaks to, um, uh, to two other additional areas. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I would call out the importance of those areas are not on page two because they're less important than the ones uh, on the previous page. And in particular, I, I, would, I would highlight that not only for, for the fact that propulsion and diagnostics uh, appear here, which is a uh, within and beyond hypersonics, uh, a tremendous strength at Purdue University. Again, national, international leadership uh, uh, centered in our Zucro laboratories, uh, which many of you may be familiar with. So that's another uh, distinctive thing I would say here. And then the, the last one, sensors and signatures, uh, again, is, is important with the others from the, from the mission execution perspective, as I've already mentioned, but also from the fact that because of the relatively poor investment in hypersonics research we had until let's say the last five years. There, there was a couple decades worth of significant winter time as the nation really, both military and civil, NASA, et cetera, you know, really de-emphasize hypersonics. And, and, and the, the penalty you pay for that is, is sort of when you need all of this uh, innovation to happen very quickly like we do now, you know, the, the bench of faculty members who have spent their careers building the foundations and the experimental equipment and, and the like, you know, are, are just not there. And I think sensors and signatures are, are one of those areas. And so thankfully we, we have actually a, a, a core strength in Purdue in, in plasma and plasma physics. Some of the professors are mentioned here, which are critical to sensors and signatures for hypersonics. But, you know, I, I can't really say that group uh, at Purdue was created uh, because of hypersonics. And so there's, there's really some important lessons here uh, that I'm not able to cover in depth on this journey, this overview, but we, we need to keep these in mind as we look forward to partnership uh, going forward and not let happen again, what we've seen over the last couple of decades in terms of underinvestment. Okay, um, so uh, another broader uh, picture broadening out here a little bit uh, at Purdue. So we've got all these great faculty who are already, you know, international leaders, but really, again, the, the last several years have just seen a tremendous growth in, in research and education innovations at Purdue, especially increasingly focused on the mission critical side. I, I mentioned, you know, really a highlight of, of what our institute did last year 
uh, among many other things, was hosting this, uh, for us, behemoth conference on campus, the NDIA Hypersonics Capability Conference. Um, not only big in terms of number of people, but the fact that we had over 400 people and were able to do uh, the second two days at the secret level was a sign of commitment from Purdue, which you know starts from President Daniels on down, and, and you know across our ecosystem from the, the campus research enterprise to our deans and our education, faculty, our students, and all the things that PRF does, both in the West Lafayette area, investing in in people and facilities, some of which you can see uh, envisioned here. It, it's really been a, a great growth building on this legacy of impact. I've already mentioned some of our areas of expertise. Uh, Joe Jewell mentioned this high pulse facility, a high enthalpy facility coming, which would allow us to do things we cannot do. You know, that. Hey, 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 come down. Come down. Don't mess, don't, don't make me come in there. Like we've got uh, another person not on mute. Um, uh, the high pulse facility will allow us to do things we cannot do or even attempt to do with our quiet uh, hypersonic tunnels in terms of looking at high temperature effects for both internal uh, and external flows and a whole range of things. So tremendous uh, new capability. And as that facility is coming to us from Northrop Grumman, uh, we're, we're working towards uh, uh, new facilities to house high pulse, the Mach 8 facility, and related computational research all at the appropriate secure levels. So exciting things going on uh, in terms of research and facilities and partnerships that are making all this happen. Um, so a dense set of data, and this is one of my first slides of a couple that I wanna say from, the, you know, these are examples. There are many other partners that we have. So I apologize if we have one of our partners that's not listed here. Uh, just like I used that, uh, that uh, brochure to make sure that none of our faculty were left out, at least from appearing on the slides. But really, uh, all of the success we've had uh, has not just been internally Purdue generated. It's because of how we've partnered. Industry, uh, you know, Lockheed Martin doing so much, uh, so well at the national level uh, in hypersonics really engage directly and through other partnerships with Purdue, direct investment, partnering on government programs and signing a master research agreement. The Air Force Research Lab, again, not to the exclusion of, of Navy and Army partners, but just a tremendous growth in our partnership, both in enabling the Mach 8 a Quiet Tunnel and a huge new multidisciplinary uh, award that we're working on right now led by Professor Paji, but with many faculty, including myself working on it. So tremendous thing. Again, Crane has been central to getting us started with some of the, uh, the Navy customers, especially those, uh, the programs, right? Working the real system. So not just getting more basic research money, but helping Purdue, um, make an impact directly with programs and through some of the industry that helps us partner with Crane and the Navy. Sandia National Labs, uh, again, not probably the organization that jumps to your mind when you think of the Indiana ecosystem, but Purdue is, a, is one of the five universities in their academic alliance program. Sandia has multiple employees stationed in Indiana, several located at the Purdue campus. Uh, they have a dedicated manager at Purdue to, to make these partnerships work, and we are working very closely with Sandia on hypersonics research and partners like Dynetics, uh, Johns Hopkins APL, and again, others. Sorry, again, you know, these are just examples of, of recent partnerships, but there are many more. Uh, there's many more research awards that our faculty are conducting, but again, I just wanted to give you a sample here of the scale uh, and how uh, we're pursuing this, not in a vacuum, you know, standard model, Purdue writes uh, faculty rights proposal to uh, NSF or AFOSR. Uh, we do that, we do that well, but we're focused on these bigger high impact event uh, opportunities. Um, if you don't believe me, and if you want to learn more, you could just go to Purdue News and, and click on a, a, the, the web links here. There's a, a lot of outreach. We've tried to publicize as much as we can these partnerships, again, not just to toot horns, but to show what's possible with Purdue uh, and, and how others of the like can, can join from FFRDCs, national labs, industry, big, medium, and small. 
Uh, and, and then certainly the things we've done with NDIA locally and nationally uh, have been very important as well. So please take a look at those. All right, this is a fun slide. Uh, notice the big P in the upper right, which has appeared in my, uh, all of my previous slides has disappeared uh, because we're not allowed to use that when we have the other universe. I'm just kidding. Uh, there's a specific reason why, why this slide is here. And that is, you know, kidding aside, no kidding, there has been tremendous partnership in hypersonics as well as other areas among the major flagship universities in Indiana because of the capabilities they bring and because all of us realize that to get what the, the industry and the government needs in hypersonics is, is advanced with a partnership. You know, and, and the state of Indiana and the, from, from the governor on down has emphasized hypersonics as a priority. IN3 continues to be a catalyst and a connector for those, uh, those activities as well. But again, I, I could go on about our partnership with Notre Dame and Indiana University. And, and another key thing is that multidisciplinary effect, right? You know, IU doesn't have uh, the strengths uh, or the mission to do aerothermodynamics and propulsion research related to hypersonics. And, and they know that, and we in Notre Dame know that. So we partner on the interfaces where IU has expertise that is critical to, to helping here, including advanced computational infrastructure modeling and simulation. And, and again, Notre Dame has a, has a mix of complementary related capabilities as Purdue, but also distinct. And, and they've developed actually with Purdue help a, a larger test section quiet Mach 6 wind tunnel. So tremendous partnerships there. And, and I would encourage all of you to, to reach out to those universities as you look for, for particular partnerships as well. Um, also, uh, again, uh, there are many uh, uh, wonderful, innovative, small companies percolating uh, around the state, but certainly within uh, the research parks that uh, the Purdue Enterprise maintains and Westgate is, is, is no uh, exception. Uh, but certainly some of these I've listed here are ones I'm familiar with. Uh, again, almost all of these uh, spun out of faculty research. Um, and uh, again, Professor Scalo there, you, you can see first uh, on the list here, I think we, you may hear from him in a future webinar in this series, which would be great. He really is a great example of innovation with his faculty hat and his, his uh, entrepreneur uh, hat as well. Adranos, a couple of companies spun out of Professor Rhodes' energetic materials research. InSpace has been uh, just for many years now, a really a gem of of uh, innovation that partners with the university so well. Um, Blue Wave is actually a firm I've come to know recently and, and partnering on some DARPA programs myself with them, but uh, they're in the data science, AI space, space, intelligent designs. Again, there are others, but I wanted you to make sure you knew that when I talk about the Purdue ecosystem and capability, that part and parcel of that are these innovative firms somehow associated with Purdue and, and again, entities like the Foundry uh, and, and others really are so instrumental of making these happen. And then the final reason um, I mentioned this is, is getting to my final slide, I think my final slide, yep, which is as promised in this uh, webinar, I, I wanted to uh, end um, with this notion of uh, just a sample of how I view systematic partnership building and, and how this could work. You could, you could shift some of these uh, components in different orders to some extent, but in my experience, uh, in thinking of, of those uh, small, medium, and large companies and, and certainly government uh, organizations out there, engaging with Purdue, whether it's funding early stage research or partnering on SBIRs, STTRs, it's really a critical first step in many cases, in almost all cases, to, to really get that intellectual connection and to get something done, which then increases probability of win for the second item, which is collaborative pursuit of, of larger R&D opportunities. Purdue views partnerships, uh, you know, not just very selfishly for how we can execute the research we wanna do, but how we can, again, contribute to the national mission by also helping other organizations um, accomplish what they need to do and, and finding ways that we can do things 
with partners that you know Purdue campus maybe can't do. That's that's perfect for partnering with with industry, especially uh, in what you can do. And if you can do, if we can be successful at that, that deepens the partnership of innovation. It's been amazing to me with some of those companies I showed on my big data slide of all the different partnerships. How, how the news spreads, right? And the model spreads within these large organizations and new innovation uh, threads develop. And I think uh, you know it, it never fails to be near the top of the list with any partner we have. These kinds of activities develop talent pipelines to feed the innovation cycle. Um, you know, first and foremost, or when, when the rubber hits the road, both in our research enterprise and our education enterprise, uh, creating the next generation innovators and engineers and scientists and, uh, and all kinds of people who can contribute to this mission is Purdue's primary mission from our land grant status uh, forward. And finally, all of this just creates so many opportunities for other things, including expanded presence uh, in our ecosystem. So some of you may be part of organizations that are, are nat nationwide organizations that didn't realize what a great place Indiana was or the Purdue West Lafayette campus in terms of uh, ways we make it easy for, for organizations to put a, a footprint and people and their own innovators right next to ours on the campus and in our laboratory. So this is, you know, again, not the only model, but I thought it was just a systematic way to think about partnerships. So I'll stop there and, uh, and address any questions uh, that are tossed my way so far. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dan, very much for that informative presentation. If you can pull up the next slide, Dan, I think it shows your email information that uh, if anyone wants to contact you for, for any specific questions. So first, I was remiss uh, earlier on, I should have thanked everyone that is on this call for serving our country, whoever has served our country, happy Veterans Day. So I should have done that to begin with because I know we have probably several people on this webinar that uh, have actually served our country. So thank you very much. But uh, Purdue at Westgate would like to thank Dr. Dan De Laurentiis and the IGSDI operations manager, Marianne Bobillo, for providing us the information, the presentation, and, and just providing an overall uh, overview on hypersonic. So it was a very, very knowledgeable and, and informative webinar. So we appreciate you joining us. As mentioned, a copy of the presentation and a recording of the webinar will be, be provided to you via email after this webinar. You can also check out any of our other webinars that we have had recorded on our YouTube channel. Just go to Westgate Academy on our YouTube channel. You can check out all of the other recorded webinars that we have done that may be of interest to you. We'd also like to do a special thanks to IN3. I know that uh, Dr. De Laurentiis had mentioned them then in his presentation. So they are a, a great partner with us here at Westgate and around the state. So we wanna thank them for sponsoring this webinar series. Uh, also just visit our, our events calendar on the Westgate-Academy website. So you can follow us and see what other types of, of webinars, events that we might be holding. So again, thank you all for attending this. I hope that conversations will continue. I see on the chat function that there's already some, some conversations that are happening. It does look like there's one other question, uh, Dan. It says, can you expand a little on what Purdue is presently doing in lightweight, high temp material research? I, I could, uh, it, would, it would be you know, a long conversation, but um, we have uh, some particular, uh, let me mention some names uh, just for you know, folks would wanna Google. Uh, Ken Sandage doing some tremendous work uh, from both a material design, but most importantly, from a manufacturability perspective um, in the ceramics and, and other application areas. We also have a tremendous strength uh, that we're transitioning to apply to the high temperature realm of, of composite materials and manufacturing. Professor Byron Pipes uh, and others have tremendous capability there uh, that we're bringing to bear. Um, some, again, some long enduring core capabilities, Professor Rod Trice and Jeff Youngblood, among others in material science, who are working on fundamental uh, models and experiments for high temperature materials, um, and, and in particular materials, for example, that might be part of developing sensor packages that could allow the sensors to, uh, you know, the material could allow the sensors to see what it need, they need to see, but also protect 
the uh, the vehicle and have a structural uh, component to them. So those are just some examples that we're working uh, across the spectrum of, of materials. And again, the exciting thing is each one of those people I mentioned are part of at least one of the multidisciplinary research efforts we have funded. And so uh, in, in my particular example of working with Professor Trice um, uh, Pipes and uh, Vikas Tomar, we're actually developing a model-based systems engineering methodology where we can translate material designs and components into a vehicle level modeling and simulation environment so we can sort of close that innovation loop of how we address the innovations and make sure that the material designs and their manufacturer are addressing realistic constraints that a vehicle would see in flight. So those are just some examples. Okay, thank you, thank you. As I had mentioned before, this is just one of the first series of webinars that we're gonna be discussing hypersonics. So make sure, like I said, go on to the westgate-academy.com website to see the list of calendar events and uh, so future so that you can actually sign on and register to, to view the other webinars that are on this topic. I think you'll be very well pleased with what we're gonna have in the future. So thank you, Dan, we appreciate it. Thank you, Marianne, for all of your help. Everyone have a great Veterans Day and hopefully we'll see you soon in person. Have a great week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.